Shalom Chavrim, and it's uh, a very sad day indeed in Israel as the one of the headlines here is King David's tomb room conquered by the church. This is out of Arut Shiva's uh, or Israel's National News publication. It says, mass service held again at David's tomb, compound this time at the room with his grave marker. Uh, ever since the Pope came there and they had a mass uh, in the upper room, the place above King David's tomb, they have celebrated a mass continually week after week. Now, some people might say, well, you know, Steve, uh, the Catholic Church is a Christian people and they're just trying to, to worship God. But you have to understand, the root of the Vatican is not Christian. It is paganistic roots from the very beginning. Uh, and this is one of the things we've been trying to help educate many people on, many of the Catholic people, Many Catholics even follow this ministry that have come out of the Catholic Church that will attest to you that their eyes have been open even from the things that we've been saying. But uh, what I'm really concerned about is that we are overlooking that literally before our eyes, biblical prophecy is actually being fulfilled right before your eyes. And I don't normally go out and say things like this. Even, even the title of the vid video, Vatican Signs covenant with Israel. Could this really be Daniel chapter 9? And that's what my concern is. And I'm not saying that I know they've signed a covenant. I don't have no idea if they did or did not. But for the Israeli government to forcibly block Jews from one of the most holy sites in Israel to the Jews and to throw them out so that the Vatican can conduct a mass inside a Jewish holy spot. I mean, we got to wake up. You don't think that the Vatican doesn't have control of Jerusalem? Then you need to wake up. And this is what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, I know there's some of you guys, you don't like me yelling and forgive me. I pray you'll bear with me. I'm, I'm, my soul is, is really livid at this point. I'm not I'm not angry, but I recognize that what's happening before us is biblical scripture being fulfilled. And if indeed this is the covenant of Daniel chapter 9, around verse 27, let me just read the scripture to you. Uh, I've marked a lot of different scripture to, to, uh, tonight, and I'm just going to read the one part here in verse 27. He says, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. During half of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease, and upon the wing of an abomination shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. Now you got to remember, this is something I was trying to allude to on the little one-minute video that I put out earlier today when I first heard the report, and that is, he, he, he takes and he stops the sacrifice and the offering. He ceases those. Now, that's because there will be a third temple. Now, I'm really getting more concerned now about who's going to build the third temple and what the service of this will be. And I know that there is some strong um, push now that the, that the temple didn't sit on the temple mount and that it actually sat over... Well, believe it or not, over there near the city of David, the modern day city of David, kind of like where the Catholic compound is, uh, where they have where uh, Caiaphas' house was, if you look at that from a biblical perspective there, or archaeological perspective, not a biblical, but an archaeological perspective. And there's been a growing movement. Even Bob Cornuk, uh, I think, recently wrote a book about this. But I know the man that started it. He sent me the video documentary he produced on this a little while back. Uh, I can't remember his name right offhand, but I, I do have that video documentary where he argues that the temple was actually not built on the Temple Mount. Now, this may be, and I, again, I'm not prophesying it. I'm just making it as a suggestion. They may decide to build a third temple there uh, just to try to, excuse me, appease everyone. So who knows what's going to happen. In fact, the Catholic Church owns the grounds there too. Uh, now they own all of Mount Zion. They're able to force the Jews out of the, uh, out of the, out of the uh, David's tomb. Uh, this is not the, the upper room above where, where they say the Lord's Last Supper was at which is, again, it's only a traditional site. It's not the real place, uh, but it's ironic. Now, let me just read to you a little bit about what happened today. So before we go further into the biblical 
ramifications. In further proof, this is from the article, mass service held again at David's tomb compound, this time at the room with his mass grave, with his grave marker. In further proof of fixed nature, um, Christian mass services being imposed on David's tomb compound, services which were filmed on Sunday, it now turns out that mass was held again on Monday morning, this time in the very room where King David's tomb is said to be located. Now, just so you know this, the Vatican, when the Pope came, said that they were only going to allow Mass twice a year in the upper room location. But it's happening every week now. And now they skip not only Sunday, but they do it on Monday as well. Uh, so anyway, uh, Rabbanit uh, uh, Yachoved Grossman, a lead activist for King David's tomb, reported to Arut Sheva that numerous priests and monks held Mass service in the room of King David's grave marker. Unlike the prayers on Sunday, which were held in the room of the Last Supper on the second floor of the compound, this time prayers were reportedly held in the very room of David's tomb, a site that has been under Jewish control. The mass prayers were accompanied by police of Yassam special forces and took place after all Jews were evicted from the holy site by Israeli police. <laughs> what side are you on? Now, I'm speaking now to the Israeli people. Those are the forces there in Israel. What side are you on? Have you fell and pray to the Vatican? And you wonder why I believe that Daniel's covenant is more than likely maybe have been signed. If you can take now and throw the Jews out of the King David's tomb, which should not have been an issue to begin with, and then wonder that you're going to be able to stop the, the sacrifices, sure you'll be able to. Why? Because the Vatican's going to own the temple as well. Let me just, let me just remind you who this prince that shall come is. Now, you got to remember, he's not the anointed prince, because when Daniel speaks of the 70th week, he says here that... Um, let me just remind you here, 70 weeks are decreed concerning thy people, concerning the holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to atone for iniquity, and to bring in an everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophet, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, therefore, understand, see, our iniquities have got to come to an end, and the way they're going to come to an end is during this 70th week, or excuse me, during the 70 weeks. Uh, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until an anointed prince shall be seven weeks. That's, uh, hello, somebody, wake up, hello. When Nehemiah, under Artaxerxes, when he's the one that gave the decree to rebuild the streets and the walls of Jerusalem. That's the decree that the angel speaks about. And from that time... Restore and to build Jerusalem until an anointed prince shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with the squares and a moat, but under troubled time. And after 62 weeks uh, shall an anointed one be cut off. So the anointed prince, the Mashiach, would come and die. I mean, you do the math. You guys know better than I do, don't you? Sometime well before 70 AD, I think it's like uh, around 33 in the common era. I mean, is it not when this man Yeshua comes and is cut off and it fits perfectly according to the prophecy? Did not Yeshua in his own parable say when he spoke about Abraham and Lazarus and, and, the, and the rich man that was in hell and he looked at Abraham and he says, Father Abraham, take one raised from the dead and send it to my family that they'll know not to come here. And he said... Though there be one raised from the dead, they won't believe it. That parable is to the Jewish people. You didn't believe it even though Yeshua raised from the dead. But what did he say? What did Abraham say? They have Moses and the prophets. And if they don't hear them, then they won't believe. So I'm declaring to you what Moses and the prophets have to say. And the prophet says, Daniel says, that there would be an anointed prince come. A Mashiach would come. But he would be cut off. Now notice, he's cut off. 
verse 26, and none will be left to him, and the people of a prince, excuse me, here's another prince, and, uh, and none will be left to him, and the people of a prince, of a prince, not a Mashiach, a prince, see, shall come destroy the city and the sanctuary, and his end shall be with a flood. So who's he, who's he of? He's of the, this prince that's going to come is of the people that destroyed the city and the sanctuary. That was the Romans. That was under the Roman general Titus. This is why the holy artifacts are in the, over there in the Vatican right now. And then you send Shimon Perez, Mr. Ahab's son, who married Jezebel, and now you've taken and you've brought Jezebel right back into Israel and brought idolatry into Israel. Shame on you for doing so, Shimon Perez, and shame on the rest of you, and shame on the military for allowing such things to be going, that you'd fall under the command of the Vatican to obey the Vatican rather than obey God. Shame on you for this. God have mercy upon your sinful soul. All right, let's look into this because we're going to go a lot deeper here. Okay, unlike the prayer, same article on Sunday, which were held in the upper room. We just read this here. It is worth noting that the institu institution of regular Catholic prayers at the site, uh, excuse me, site, co uh, I can't make out that word there, a severe breach of Jewish prayer rights. Rabbi Avraham Goldstein, dean of the diaspora uh, yeshiva located in the compound, warned Arush Shiva in May that Jews will be prevented from entering the holy site altogether due to the mass services. Given that Jewish law forbids using a building used for idol worship, a category which Catholic worship uh, with it uses uh, of effigies fall under according to Jewish law. No entry for Jews. Mm. Rabbinette Grossman related that as her usual morning custom, she arrived with a dozen female Jewish visitors to pray at David's tomb on Monday, slightly before 9 a.m. A police officer wearing a kippah entered and asked all worshipers to leave. In response to the rabbinate's questioning, the officer refused to give a direct reason for the order, but simply repeated his demand, saying there, there is an event here. The rabbinate reports that she and other worshipers felt a sense of shock at the idea that they might be forced out uh, to give way to Christian prayer in uh, the hall of David's tomb. After asking the officer whether her uh, suspicions were correct and there were plans to hold mass services, she notes the officer stuttered, yes. He was in, in embarrassment. I asked him to let us sanctify the site by saying psalms, but there was no choice and we were forced to leave. Imagine that. Does anybody seem to recall that the Catholic Church, Pope Pius XII, backed Hitler? Now, don't give me none of this that, you know, well, he became a good guy a little bit later and everything. He only did that because he knowed that Hitler was losing the war. And so he tried to do a few little acts of kindness before he got exposed for the ungodly devil that he really was. And here we have again, what do we have now? You know, when Jews are told they cannot pray in their own place that God has given us to go to, your own, our own holy ground, so to speak, I mean, what else, what else has got to happen? What's going to wake up? You know, I, I think of my, my friend Laurie Cadoza Moore when we talk about anti-Semitism and, and we've been talking about things here late, lately about, about the Vatican and, and what they're up to. And I pray to God that my sister will really take a stand and recognize the evils that the Vatican is doing against the Jewish people. You want to talk about anti-Semitism, this is anti-Semitism. Where is it going to next? What are they going to do next? And there's already, it's already rumored out there that they've already taken over the Kotel as well, that that's really no longer under Jewish control. Just wait till they throw all the Jews out of there next, too. That's, that's coming. You think it's not? It's coming. Believe me, when I was in the Temple Institute, they were already grooming us as visitors to know that Jerusalem was not under the hands of uh, of Israel any longer. Okay, now this was when I was over there here uh, a month or so ago, 
And, and uh, th th this is killing me, guys. This is killing me, I tell you. I, I thank God for it, but it's still killing me. Um, so anyway, he shall make a strong covenant. Then we get to verse 27. With many for one week and during half of the week it shall cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease upon the wing of an abomination shall come one who makes desolate. All right, now, so we realize that we may very well have a covenant. And the reason why I say we may have a covenant signed is because now the Jewish people are losing all their rights. And the Catholic Church now has the right above them. If they've got... If they can exercise a right above the Jewish people, something is wrong. Something seriously is wrong. Now, I, I need to read to you, and this is for my Jewish brethren that don't want to believe anything about Christianity, and I can understand why you, you, you feel the way you do, because the Vatican claims to be the mother church. Well, you know, the Bible clearly says, in the book of Revelation written by John, who was a Jew, says that she is the mother of harlots and all abominations of the earth. So therefore, we know, according to one of her own that came out of, out of the Vatican, uh, that she is actually the creator of Islam, the, the Muslim religion. You, you don't, I mean, let me, let me just share with you. See, we're sitting here down by, uh, by Jaffa, and right here, as we're here at Jump of filming, we, you have two Muslims, a man and his wife, sitting there with their beads doing their prayers. Where, where, do, where do the Muslims get a rosary from? Why do they esteem Mary as a great woman? Why is Jesus considered a prophet? You've got to remember, the Catholic Church, when they were forming this religion, it was really to help annihilate Jewish people. Uh, and they, did, they, they wanted to take the heat off of the Vatican as being the Antichrist. So they created this religion and, and made themselves a little Mahdi in there to be the Antichrist. But the problem was, the Vatican had a little bit of a consciousness about themselves. And they thought, well, we can't have them hate Jesus or Mary because we need them to be on our side. And of course, as generations would come down through there, the people that will join that religion, they won't have any idea. So we've got to make sure that they love Catholic people. That's why people like uh, uh, Walid Shobat, who is a Catholic to begin with, that doesn't say he is, but he is, he's a Catholic. That's why he runs around the world preaching and, and getting all the mainstream religious leaders to accept that it's a Muslim Mahdi, it's a Muslim Antichrist, you know? You guys, I, 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 I say this with love and respect for the people that are out there that are still mixed up, and you got Obama as the Antichrist, you got somebody else as the Antichrist, you got you a Jewish guy as the Antichrist, you know, uh, oh, you know, everybody, you'll, you'll agree, well, the Pope is the false prophet, we can agree with that and everything. You need to realize Satan wants to be like God. He wants to be worshipped as if he were God. And you have to remember, you know, you have a trinity in Christianity. Do you think Satan's dumb? He wants the same type of setup as well. Now, we know the true believers know there's only one God. But God himself came down and lived in the man called Yeshua. He lived in that human body and gave, used that body as a sacrifice for the sins of Israel and for the world. Okay, this is what God did in order to restore the life, to be able to put the Holy Spirit back in his people, to restore Israel back to who she should be. Now, the thing is, is the, the Satan, though, he wanted to be like God, worshipped as if he were God, and sit in the temple as if he is God. And so he's also creating himself a multi-facet uh, thing. So he can be the Antichrist, he can be the false prophet. He's only changing his mask for the type of job that he's doing at that time. You understand what I'm saying? So the thing is, is it should be pretty obvious to you now. It's a, a world leader, uh, a religious kind of guy. He's going to control the world. You know how much I've heard about this, about the Antichrist, back when they were picking all these different Arabic guys that could be it, you know? Uh, <laughs> and they would say, he's going to rule the world, and, and, and he's going to be a one-world religion. Hello. Have you guys noticed that the Catholic Church is trying to make a one world religion called Chris Islam. Have you noticed that the Muslims and the Jews and the so called Christians are all down there? Have you noticed people like Kenneth Copeland, Joel Osteen recently, and the Pope asked him to pray for him? Uh, all these great dignitaries and people of these great religions, and all, and even China now, all having the Pope around the world, every country in the world. He's conquering the entire world. 
Well, next he'll declare himself to be the Messiah, and he will declare that he is to rule by a rod of iron. What you don't understand, he's fabricating prophecy, and he's going to make it look like that the Messiah is here. This is what he's trying to perpetrate to the Jews. But luckily, according to the scripture in Daniel here, that covenant's going to be broke in the midst of the week. So about three and a half years, we're going to have to go through hell. Pardon the expression, but that's what's going to happen. Israel, you're really going to have it hard. Okay, let me show you, though, from, from the Christian Bible that we rejected. And let me just share with you what it says here. And there was given me, chapter 11, a reed likened to a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Okay, the Gentiles are going to tread the holy city under underfoot for forty and two months. Now the holy city, by the way, is... King David's old city, which is the city of David outside the walls now, the Turkish walls that are there. It's the Mount Zion area there where the upper room is. It is the Kotel. It is the uh, uh, part of the Jerusalem quarter. Uh, it is the Muslim quarter. It is the Christian quarter, so-called. Do you realize they already have it? It is given to them. Who gave it to them? Who in the Israeli government was low enough to give the Gentiles, the Vatican, God's city? I, I, I'm just, I'm blown away by this. Let me, let me share with you some more. Here's another post here. This is from Israel National News. Jew, Jews protest at King David's tomb over Christian prayer. Uh, says the Christian prayer at the tomb of uh, King David, and, and, and for us, this is blasphemy, one of the Jewish protesters, Shagabran Brand, told AFP about Christian prayers there on Sunday, calling it a provocation. The Jewish protester also hung placards in the nave, uh, uh, nave accusing the government of lying by saying the... Uh, uh, cynical, the cynical status quo would remain unchanged and under Israeli authority. Controversy continues to reign over whether or not Israel has plans to, to, to transfer full control of the site to the Vatican. Um, you know, th it's just unreal. Uh, David's tomb, another article, David's tomb status quo breached by Catholic mass services. Footage showed David's tomb compound has been handed over to fixed Catholic worship, endangering Jewish prayer rights. Contraver uh, co contrary to the internal security minister Yitzhak uh, Aronovich promises, um, uh, they must have had a typo in the word there, so I can't make that out. Affairs and Environmental Committee uh, Chair M.K. Mario Agev uh, from the Likud Party in uh, mid-May, not to change the status quo at King David's tomb. The status has been breached in a move endangering Jewish prayer at the holy site. Rabbi uh, Devere Taldin of the King David Yeshiva, which is attached to the diaspora Yeshiva on the site of King David's compound on a, a Yeshiva about the Catholic mass services, which were conducted at the site on Sunday, and which he reports have been held weekly since Pope Francis conducted mass at the two uh, site two weeks ago on Monday. Video footage courtesy of Rabbi Ta uh, Tal exposes the mass prayers held on the second floor of David's tomb compound, which uh, Christians term the room of the Last Supper. The rabbi reports hundreds of Christian visitors, priests, Catholic monks, and nuns praying at the site as evidenced by the film. The police are seen refusing Rabbi Tal's request for an explanation as to why he is being forbidden from entering. Uh, as he has done for many years on Sundays. In the clip, Christian visitors are seen entering and exiting freely, even as Jews are forbidden access. Rabbi Ta uh, Tal is heard saying he is being prevented from, from going up because of the mass services, which have been conducted since the Pope visits two weeks ago. It should be noted that the institution of regular Catholic prayers at the site constitute a severe breach in Jewish prayer rites. So, so much is true. Now, let me just, let's start looking at some more of the biblical ramifications for all this. Um, let me share with you, too, what the Vatican has done here. In Daniel chapter 11, as another prophecy regarding this, 
Um, and this is in verse 20, well, part of 21 and then going into 22, uh, 23 and, and uh, yeah, 23. Uh, but he shall come in without difficulty and obtain the kingdom by flatteries and force of the flood shall be swept away before him and shall be broken even the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Now, I've always kind of held that to be the Palestinians. But then again, as I'm seeing things unfold here, could it be actually government officials in the Israeli government? Could there be something else besides that? Uh, or is it the Palestinian people? Or is it a combination of both? I'm not really sure on that, but nonetheless... It is obvious that he is making these things happen nonetheless. Uh, now, another thing I want to remind my Jewish brothers on, and that's what we're going to look at here next, and that is from uh, the book of Micah. Um, I have that. I thought I'd marked it, but I didn't. Okay, but I know right where it's at. Micah chapter 4. And this is something, and by the way, for those of you, and I know that there have been some that have... Uh, there was one man out there that came out and said that I had uh, prophesied falsely about uh, Rachel and having the two children in her womb and that there were not two states that came forth after the nine-month negotiations. Now, you have to remember, when I first began to speak about the nine-month negotiations, I said back then that I believed that, the, that it, was, it would be the two states between the Palestinians and the Israelis and that this was the actual the fulfillment of Rachel's vision, I said, from what it looks like to me. Then later, I actually began to speak about how that it will be two states, but it looks like that what Rachel sees is the Vatican there. So it looks more like Daniel's vision as far as the, as the covenant is with, not with, the, and I actually changed in that and saw that the covenant is not between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The covenant is between the Vatican in Israel and the Palestinians are just the pawn that is in there and truly as we begin to uncover and see in the scripture that Esau or Edom as we find in the scripture according to Ezekiel 35 that speaks of this very case here is actually the Vatican and even amongst amongst the Orthodox Jews we can take and trace Esau's lineage and it goes right to Rome now we also see that it spreads beyond Rome goes into Europe and even in the United States why because everywhere the Vatican conquered, that's where Adam went. That's where Esau went. Now, the two children that are in Rachel's womb are Esau and Jacob. Israel and, of course, Rome is what they're speaking of. And as she's prophesying, God says to her, he says, there are two nations in your womb. And when they come forth, when this nine-month negotiation is complete, there will be two nations. See, there's two nations right there. Now, what do we have here when we look at this? We don't know, even though John Kerry and the United States there, when they entered into this nine-month negotiations with Israel uh, over the Palestinian two-state solution, as it was called, <clears throat> it was shortly thereafter that the Vatican, at the end of this nine-month negotiations, that they come to Israel, and all of a sudden, everything has changed. But the Vatican also got involved into this process here not long after, guess what, after it started with John Kerry in the United States. So where did that nine-month negotiation really begin? It did not begin with John Kerry and Mahmoud Abbas and uh, Ms. Lavini with the Israeli government there. This actually began when the Vatican got involved. And I think if you calculate that time there, we had a nine-month negotiation. We can see Micah's prophecy fulfilling right before our eyes. And as far as the Palestinians being a state, they are a state. If the Vatican declares them to be a state, the United Nations declares them to be a state, it doesn't matter what Israel has to say then, does it? Because they're going to over-trump anything Israel says. As we can see, Israel does not even have control of her own military forces because the military is there to be there to protect the Jews. But instead of protecting the Jews, they are now ordering the Jews out of their own places and they are falling under the command of someone else. Now, who is that someone else? That's something you have to ask yourself. By the way, I guarantee you I will no longer be popular 
with hardly anybody. And I guess to be associated with me, be a friend of mine, would just make it that much harder for you as well. Because believe me, you have no place to go run and hide. You're not going to be able to hide in your church anymore. Uh, you know, if you're a part of these systems that have joined in with the Catholic Church and you really need to see where your church stands on this, you're in serious danger as it is. Because the Bible says, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins. See, we don't want the plagues that are going to come upon the Vatican and upon her harlot daughters because there's this big push about come home to the mother church and everything. Well, they're going home all right. You know, and she is the mother. The Bible clearly says she's the mother of harlots and abominations. And this is why you see all these denominational preachers. And isn't it funny? It's the ones that all have all that money. You know, that's the ones that go back. Why? They're afraid to lose their money. They're hoping that God will just wink at this and say, oh, it's no big deal. You're afraid of losing your money. You sold out for money instead of God. And that's a shame on you. I can't encourage you enough. And, I, and the brothers that I know that are ministers, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I adjure you, separate yourself from anything that has to do with the Vatican. If you're part of a 501c, then the government owns you. You need to separate from that as well. And I know that don't sound good. That's why I refuse to be a 501c myself. You know, because why? I'm not going to allow the government to own what we are. We're a church because the Word of God says we are. And that's what it matters. Okay? <clears throat> anyway, let me read to you here in Micah here. He says, Now why dost thou cry aloud? Is there no king in thee? You're seeing another. We just saw Revelation chapter 11 being fulfilled. They're given the, 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 uh, the outer court. The Gentiles are given the outer court. The Vatican has been given the outer court. It's proof they threw the Jews out. It's given to them. Okay? All right, so I'm trying to get you to see this. We, we also saw Daniel 9, chapter 27 there. There's a covenant made between the, this Roman prince and uh, Israel. So in order for them to be able to throw out the Jews, they had to make some kind of covenant. Pretty obvious, isn't it? Now, is it the exact covenant of Daniel 9, 27? I, I can't answer that. I, I don't know. So before you go out there and say, Brother Steve says we are absolutely in the tribulation. I can't say that for sure. But it looks like there's a very good possibility that that 70th week has begun. That's the, that's the part that I need you to really get serious about. And if there's any hope at all for your love to, to get our loved ones in to get them to recognize Christ we need to really start shaking the bushes and we need to start praying we got to take this serious because I don't know where God cuts that line off but I'm going to tell you something we're, 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 this is no time to play church any longer if you're going to get serious with God you need to get serious with God right now if you have not repented if you're watching this video and you're not a Christian I adjure you give your life to Yeshua HaMashiach I, and you, believe me, <clears throat> if you don't know anything else but Jesus Christ, if that's what makes you feel good to say, Jesus, that's okay. He understands that too. He's not going to hold that against you. You just give your life to Him so that He can come and fill you with the Holy Spirit. Give your life to Him. Believe upon Him and God will make a difference for you, whether you're Jewish, Christian, whatever. you know. And I know for the Jewish people, it's hard for you to even think this if you're watching this video because the problem is, is right now all you can see is the cross is there again to destroy more Jews. My brethren, that has nothing to do with true Christians. That has nothing to do with the true Jews that believe that Yeshua is Mashiach. You know why you don't see many of them? I know, I know Rabbi Singer, he made that comment one time. He says, where, where is the original uh, followers of Jesus? Where is his descendants? Well, you know what? Rome and the Muslims killed them all off, as well as the Jewish people that didn't believe them. You killed them off. But you didn't kill off that spirit where God kept leading and calling and crying out and bringing them out. And yes, the Vatican tried to kill off all the Christians as well. 66 million of them. Not just the Jews were killed in the Holocaust. Down through the Dark Ages, the Vatican murdered the, Jew, the, the true Christians as well, trying to wipe them out. So anyway, let's, let's look at what he says here. Another prophecy being fulfilled now. Micah chapter 4. 
We can see that Rachel's vision, uh, or not so much a vision, but when the Lord spoke to her and says, why am I thus? You have two nations within your womb, you know? When they come forth, it'll be two nations. See, there, there it is, the Vatican. And the reason why it's called two nations, even though it's Esau, even though it's the Vatican, the Vatican has sided with the Palestinians. So the nation is the Palestinians, okay? And Israel is the other nation in this particular regards here. But it's still the Vatican. Vatican is Esau. Because the Vatican, according to Daniel 11, is only using the Palestinians to be able to pull this off. So it's a little complicated marriage there. Um, <clears throat> so God asked, or the prophet asked, Now why dost thou cry aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? So the prophet Micah immediately is beginning to call, call Israel back to remembrance of her sins. And her sin was she rejected Samuel the prophet. And she wanted a king to be like the rest of the nation to lead them out into battle. Well, look what your king is doing right now, my brother, sisters. Those of you that are, in, that are, 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 are lamenting and mourning and weeping, and now you're really beginning to pray and ask God, when are you going to deliver us, Lord? When are you going to bring Mashiach? Kol hazman Adonai, efoh hamashiach. You're asking that question. You know why? Because why? Where is your king? Is there no king in thee? What has happened to, 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 to Benjamin Netanyahu? He, I said years ago when he was first elected to a Jewish girl, and I told her, and I pray that God make her cause this video to come across her eyes. I said, it'll never work as good of a man as he is and as hard as he'll try. It won't work because we've got to recognize that a king will not work. We've got to go back where we left God. And so the prophet asks, is thy counselor perished? He's trying to get us to wake up and realize that according to Daniel chapter 9, that the, the Mashiach was going to be cut off. An anointed prince would be cut off. And so Dan, Micah even asks you, where is our prince, or excuse me, our, our counselor? Is he perished? It does, not, does not Isaiah say that he would be called the mighty God, El Gibor? He's called the counselor. The Prince of Peace. So, what does he say? Is thy counselor perished? So he's letting you know you've already killed your Messiah. That pains have seized thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. Now see, this is not, this is not the mother. This is daughter. This is the, the, our brothers and sisters today. Like a woman in travail, for now shalt thou go out of the city. And thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt come to Babel. <laughs> that's, that's a twofold purpose right there. You go out of the city, see, <clears throat> and you're going to dwell in the field. Why? In East Jerusalem, we're gonna, you're going to get kicked out. You're just going to wake up one day, and the police are going to come in there and drag you all out like they did over there in the, uh, in, in the West Bank and in Gaza. The outskirts of Gaza, we were, our people were just drug out by our own military. But this time, your military is under a little bit different control than what it used to be. Isn't that interesting? No wonder why the military of America met with the Israeli military. Yet, to, for, you forget that the Israeli, excuse me, the, the American military is under control of the United Nations, which is controlled by the Vatican. Uh, okay, let's go. There shalt thou be, excuse me, uh, but he also says in there, and thou shalt come to Babel, or Babylon. Yeah, that was fulfilled yesterday. Shimon Perez, son of Ahab, has come to Babylon. You know, it's funny, when Ahab married Jezebel and they brought idolatry into Israel, and you, you get the picture now, you see why these articles are saying it's idolatry. Jezebel brought her gods into Israel. The Vatican has all kinds of gods. They made Mary a god. Mary was a good woman, a godly woman. But they made her into a god. They have all kinds of saints and whatever. They're gods and they pray to them as well. And uh, everything you can think of, they make a god. They're burning incense and candles and everything else. Everything is, becomes a god to them. So anyway, Jezebel brought in the gods and everything. And, and of course... Ahab finally repents before the Lord in sincerity. When Elijah, God had told Elijah that he was going to take his life, 
But then God says to Elijah, see how Ahab repents before me. He said, go tell him, I won't bring this upon him, but I'm going to bring it upon his son. You don't think Elijah's coming back? Let me tell you something. That right there proves that Elijah's coming back because God said that he would bring it upon Ahab's son. And God wasn't talking about Ahab's sons back in his day. God was talking about history was going to repeat itself. And there would be a modern day Ahab's son here that would bring Jezebel right back down to Israel, bring idolatry right back down into Israel, which you've done, Mr. Perez. You have brought idolatry into Israel. And you think God is pleased with this? Your only hope is to do like your forefather Ahab. You better repent. So he asks that question, or he says to him that you will come down into Babylon. Babel, <clears throat> there shalt thou be rescued. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. In other words, God's letting you know when all this happens, it's letting you know that this will be the time that he's going to redeem us. But we got to remember, according to Revelation, we're going to go through this for three and a half years before the covenant gets broken. Now, somewhere along the way, he's going to send those two witnesses. I don't know if that's fixing to happen. Does it happen a year into this negotiation? Does it happen when the covenant is broken? I'm not sure about that. I know different brothers I've spoke to have different opinions. I know Brother Rob Conrad believes it's at the middle part, and that may be so. I don't know that answer. But the thing is, is I do know that there are two witnesses going to come. It's going to be Moses and Elijah. And it's clear by the evidence that lays in the Scripture who will come. Now, so let's go on a little further here. Um, <clears throat> so he says to her there, uh, you're going to be redeemed. And now many nations are gathered against thee that say, let her be defiled and let our eyes look upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither do they understand his counsel. See, they're, let, they're defiling her right now. Do you not get that? You're seeing the scripture fulfilled by brothers over in Israel right now. And I'll be back there with you soon. But you're seeing scriptures being fulfilled by God's grace. I'll be there with you and I'll pray with you as well as we fight this demonic spirit that the Vatican has brought in. Uh, but anyway, um, so he says there that, that, that um, let our lives look upon Zion but because uh, they, they want to defile it, and they're doing it. Now, they don't know the thoughts of the Lord, neither do they understand his counsel, for he has gathered them as the sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thy horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many peoples, and thou shalt devote their gain to the, to the Lord, and their substance of the Lord of the whole earth. Now, uh, ga uh, gash thyself, O daughter of troops. Uh, he has laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. Amazing, isn't it? Now, if you think about this too, God says for them that they're going to thresh the floors. Think about the story of Ruth as well. Don't forget about the story of Ruth because when Ruth goes in there to lay at the feet of Boaz, which is the redemption of Israel as well as the bride of Yeshua, what is Boaz there doing? He's there at the threshing floor. It is symbolic of the very hour which God manifests the word of Micah and that is at the time of the threshing that God will bring and thresh, he will also redeem Israel. Mm. Every, everything, it's just fastened so together. I just love the Word of God. I mean, like I said, my heart is heavy, but my heart is also joyful to know that God is going to bring His judgments upon this evil, ungodly, unadulterated, or, 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 or sinful generation that it is. All right, let's, let's continue on now. Um, Oh gosh, I just pray I don't forget some of the scriptures I wanted to share with you here, but let's, let's move forward again. Now we want to take and look as well another issue that was happening here. Um, in Ezekiel 35, as I mentioned to you before, another scripture that is being fulfilled as we speak here, because thou has had a perpetual hatred and has hurled the children of Israel to the power of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of their final punishment. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare thee to blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Surely thou hast hated thine own blood, therefore blood shall pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Seir most definite. What does he mean by the hate of their own blood? That's the Vatican. The Vatican does not, they hate the blood of Yeshua. Don't tell me they love him. They don't love him because they've killed his saints. They killed the Jews. 
Jews. They trod down anybody that gets in their way. <clears throat> Thus uh, will I make Mount Seir most desolate and cut off from it who, who comes and goes, and I will fill its mountains with its slain men. The coming and going, that's all these dignitaries and religious leaders. Remember, there's two keys on his flag. One of them's political power, one of them's religious power, and he's got the keys to both. So anyway... <clears throat> I, I will fill its mountains with its slain men and thy hills and thy valleys and with the water courses shall they fall that are slain with the sword. I will make thee perpetual desolations and thy cities shall not have a restoration and you shall know that I am the Lord because thou hast said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine and we will possess it though the Lord was there. The only place the Lord was was in Israel and you have come to take that. Why? Why does he say the Lord was there? Because because even though you've turned it into two states, you've made a Palestinian state and you've made a state of Israel as two nations and everything, the Lord was in both those areas. It's just like Bethlehem where he was born. You got it under Palestinian control. Israel, take back all of the land that God gave you. As I live, says the Lord God, I will do according to, to thy anger as, uh, and according to thy envy, which thou hast used at thy hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I shall judge thee. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord and that I have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate and they are given to us to consume. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and have multiplied multiplied your words against me I have heard them thus says the Lord God when the whole earth rejoices I will make thee desolate as thou didst rejoice in the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate so will I do to thee thou shalt be desolate O Mount Seir and all Edom all of it so there is some severe judgments that are coming down right now and as again as I'm telling you these things we are seeing Bible prophecy just literally coming to pass all around us. And I can't encourage you enough. Every person you can get saved, get saved. Please do all you can. This is the hour to do. We, we've been talking about this, guys, for, for some time now. We, we really have. I've talked to you about this for a while. You know, letting you know that, the, you know, the time's going to come. There's going to be a covenant signed. I mean, we've been sitting here on the edge of our seat and we watched John Kerry and, and, and this nine-month negotiations, you know. And then, of course, that doesn't happen. you got to remember, Satan keeps our mind distracted with something there uh, while the big picture is going on in the background. You know, we're missing what's going on on a regular basis. We're missing it. Because he's, he uses something over here to distract your attention while something else is going on. It's just like when in 1993, when Shimon Perez was having again the Vatican, and they looked like the Oslo Accords were going on with, within Yasser Arafat and uh, Bill Clinton. That was just to keep you distracted while Shimon Perez made sure he signed a covenant with the Vatican back then. You know... My brothers, sisters, the hour for playing church is over. This is the most serious time in all of the world's history. Do you realize that somewhere very near in the not so distant future, it could be as far away as three and a half years. Brother Rob Conrad may be right. Maybe that's when he brings his two witnesses. I always myself lean, lean towards closer to the beginning. Recently, I had another brother tell me, he says, I think it'll be probably about a year into, um, into that ministry. And then when he said that, it made me think of Joseph, where he made himself known to his brother and two years into the famine and five years later, you know, because he said there are still yet five years. I, I just don't know what the answer to these things are. But I do know that when those witnesses come, they preach three and a half years. I know that there's so many prophecies that have been unfulfilled in the life of Moses. He said to the Lord, he said, they're going to ask me, what is your name? What do I tell him? And God says to him, I am that I am. But the funny thing is, they never ask him that. 
He goes down at the, at the, uh, after crossing the Red Sea and, 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 <clears throat> and the victory was given over Pharaoh and his army. He says, I will sing unto the Lord. I've gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. A song that he's singing about a future tense that he's not speaking of at that moment. He's letting you know that there comes a time that, he's, that God's going to give him victory over what the horse and his rider. It's just one horse, one rider, not 600. Moses got victory over 600 there. Isn't it ironic too when Moses is arguing with God about not being able to speak or anything and then he says to God, he says, send him whom you will send. That's in the future as well. And he tells God, send him whom you will send. Moses, maybe he doesn't even realize what he's saying, but he's already prophesying of another guy that God's going to come. His successor, maybe you might call it, whatever you want to say. And then clearly the scripture says that Elijah is supposed to come and restore all things. Hmm. What do we do with all this? What do we do? And then we see when Yeshua uh, or John writes about the two witnesses of Revelation 11 there, they have the gifts that Moses and Elijah both had. God even tells Moses, he said, if they don't believe the voice of the first sign, they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And clearly, even Paul, when he taught it, Israel never believed Moses. It only makes you wonder what's happening, what's on the horizon. Nonetheless, so we, we can see this. It seems very obvious. The biblical prophecy. The very prophecies of the Daniel 70th week, the last, as they say, seven year of tribulation. And I've always said myself, true tribulation is only the last three and a half years. But one thing's for sure, you're fixing to see Rome dictate how things are going to be. Your lives are going to change drastically. You're not going to be able to buy or sell. Not the way you think. I don't even think even that's going to be the way we think it is. It may be a lot slyer than you realize. The thing is, is he is rallying like crazy all the world and church leaders and Muslim leaders behind him. Does anybody realize what I'm saying to you? People like me, they want to shut us up. I can't tell you whether or not this video will stay on the air. They may shut our channel down. One thing, let me just share with you in closing. Would you share, would you do yourself a favor, your friends a favor, God a favor? Would you share this video everywhere you possibly humanly can? Would you post it on your channel? Would you screen capture this video so that somebody has an archive of this to where if they do shut it down and shut my channel down, it could be posted somewhere else? Would you take and share this video with every Facebook member you have? Would you post it on other people's walls? Would you have your friends post it? Will you take and share it with your friends and your co-workers and people in your churches and your pastors and stuff? Would you share it with them to get them them to maybe wake up and recognize the hour we're living in? Would you share it with Jewish friends that you have? Every unbeliever you know. I'm hoping that it'll cause people to recognize the hour we're living in. It's so late, my friends. It's so late. I love you with all of my heart. Um, Check out our website. We are doing a trip, by the way, and by, that's one thing too, I'll just mention to you quickly. You want to, we're going up, uh, we've already planned to be in Chicago with Sister Le Leora. Uh, you can see that on our website. I don't know if it's on the website yet or not, but it is on our Facebook page, uh, meeting on July 12th. Uh, there's a pre-registration, it doesn't cost anything. Also, some uh, the brothers and sisters in uh, northwestern North Carolina, I'm not sure the city yet there, 
Uh, they're planning a meeting there on the, either the 14th or 15th of July, but we're going to be going through Nashville, Indianapolis, Indiana, Kentucky, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, a lot of these places here. If you, and, and the size group doesn't matter, if you want to host a meeting there to where we can come and speak to whoever we can that will listen and hear, give us a call, give us a ring. Our contact information is on our website at israelreturns.com. We love you. Good night. God bless you. Pray for me. Pray for my family. We'll be going back home here before too long. That time's quickly coming upon us. Within a couple of months, we'll go back to Israel again. Pray for us. We really need your prayers, and we thank God for you. Good night. Erev Tov.